Welcome to Bookaholics, the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking's new podcast series dedicated to books. In this series, sponsored by PIC's partner organization, the Red Wheel Barrel Bookstore, we will introduce you to recent and relevant books, our own books, and obviously classic books that we just can't stop talking and teaching about. My name is Christoph van Houten, and in this first episode of Bookaholics, I am joined by Jonathan Ray to talk about his latest book, A Schoolmaster's War, Harry Ray, British Agent in the French Resistance, published only a week, a couple of weeks ago by Yale University Press. Hello, Jonathan, and welcome. Hello, Christoph. Lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you again as well. Now, Jonathan, considering that you are the author of this book, why don't we start with you giving a small description of what the book is about and, more importantly, what you tried to do in the book? Well, the book is about my father, um, and in particular, it's about what he did in the year 1943. He'd, he was a young schoolmaster um, at the beginning of the Second World War, and he was also a conscientious objector. But then he, he, he decided that he would give up his conscientious objection, not really for a matter of principle, because he thought that if he was going to continue to be a schoolmaster, he would lose the respect of his um, of his pupils if he did not take part in the war. So he decided to take part in the war. And because he was quite good at French, he was drafted into this very special part of the British Army called the Special Operations Executive, uh, whose job was to drop agents behind enemy lines in, in occupied Europe to assist local resistance movements. And that's precisely what 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 he did he worked in in the Jura in, fr in France um, in uh, for a f the, for the best part of a year in in 1943 um, organizing sabotage training and sabotage and above all sending messages back to London to arrange for aircraft to come over and drop armaments and explosives to help the French resistance. That's, so that's the basic story. But um, how I came to write it was that um, uh, three or four years ago, I, a, a French soldier in, the, in that region, in the, in the Jura, in the Franche-Comté, um, got in touch with me and said he admired my father and he was going to have a little ceremony dedicating a plaque to, his, to, to commemorate his work. And I I, I was uh, astonished and interested, and I went over there, and there was a wonderful ceremony with the mayor, and people sang the Marseillaise, and uh, and and great pomp and ceremony. And then people asked me, "Well, what did your father actually do during the war?" And I had to say, "Well, he never talked about it to me. He never, and and I never, and nor did I ever really ask him." And so when I got back, I started reading books about it there are some books about it and i discovered that there were a number of papers that he'd left behind and i started to piece the story together and the the book consists um the heart of the book is things that he wrote both at the time and immediately afterwards and then some things that he wrote retrospectively 30 years later and i put a whole apparatus around it to tell the story so it's a slightly um well it's an exercise in recovering uh the story of the past but it's also well i'm very interested in the question of what it means to of, of what, what's a good way to write the story of a life and it's always struck me i mean well perhaps always i think so, since i read sartre as a teenager because this is very much a, a, a jean paul sartre's argument i think his main argument is that when we talk about selfhood and uh or the soul or the person what we really need to um, think about is what it means to tell the story of a life and what we really need to guard against is telling the story of a life as though it was something that had a simple beginning and middle and an end or that's something that could be told from a single point of view so I was very pleased to be able to assemble this story from all sorts of different sources which sometimes even contradict each other about matters of fact so that you're left with um, and the story is fragmentary but maybe the story is fragmentary because Life is fragmentary. Yes, that's, that's very true. Um, now, as is probably with every book one reads, there are always some topics or some issues that stand out. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to pick your brain a little bit on some of these topics, Jonathan. And uh, a first question that I would just like to ask you regards the whole Second World War. 
obviously for you there is this personal connection with your father as most of the european european people have with their father or with their grandfathers but there's more at stake here i think it, it seems as if uh, people can't stop going back to the second world war for one reason or another there seems to be something i think that that draws us to it and and this for very opposite reasons as well so on the on the one hand the Second World War is one of the most horrific events of our recent, but not just our recent history. But on the other hand, there's also something different to it. And and I think your father pointed this out quite remarkably in the book, and, and which which makes people think about it in, in a whole different way. And what I mean is that on numerous occasions, he hints at, at the fact that there was a joyous aspect to it as well. He actually mentions a couple of times that he thought of it, or he considered it on a, on occasions, as if it was a, a holiday. Now, how would you interpret this this attraction, this whole attraction with the Second World War in its totality, and then this ambivalence that that is also present in this remembering? I think on the he did say. I mean, that's all that he ever said to me. Really, was that his experience was just like a holiday and riding along the deserted roads in the French countryside and getting wonderful meals and drinking lots of wine. Uh, but I actually think uh, I was wrong to accept those statements at face value. It seems to me, having looked at it more closely, that it was actually a, a period of, well, not only constant danger, but also of a great deal of pain, because he did form very, very strong relationships with with people young and old, and many of them, many, many of them um, made extraordinary sacrifices. Many of them lost their lives because of their involvement with him. And I think that on the whole, he was, uh, <laughs> when he said it was like a holiday, that was actually, he was deceiving us and perhaps to some extent deceiving himself. But as for the wider question of why we keep going back to the war, it's funny, I think it's, it seems to be, uh, was it perhaps one of the first great wars that was seen in such moral terms that, you know, it wasn't a matter of defending one's country against another country, but it was presented, I mean, especially, I suppose, by Churchill as a, as a matter of um, defending um, good against evil. And I think that that continues to obsess people, certainly, in Britain, I mean, it's been, it's indeed, it's part of a, a lot of the the current uh, coronavirus crisis is articulated in Britain in the language of war. And people say, well, you know, we we won the Second World War, so we're going to win the battle against this virus, and which is obviously completely ridiculous. But it does say something about the role that the war plays in the imagination of um, of of British people. And it is very interesting to go back and read, for example, what my father says about how his conscience was not at all clear. He says that in so many words, and that he, you know, he couldn't stand Churchill, and he didn't want to be part of anything that could be interpreted as supporting po Churchill's politics. So at the time, it wasn't in, it wasn't, there was none of that clear morality. And, of, and as far as the French resistance is concerned, well, I think the French have great difficulty in uh, remembering that time adequately. I mean, there was a period when it, was, it seemed as though everybody uh, in France was supposed to have been part of the resistance, which is obviously ridiculous. And then uh, things went rather into reverse. I think it's more nuanced now. But um, I, the fact is that many people lived through those years of, um, of, of occupation in France, and they, you know, they helped the resistance a bit, and and in, and and they also collaborate. Well, what does it mean to collaborate? It was impossible, really, to survive without some degree of collaboration. And I think uh, what we are one of the reasons why it's so fascinating is that once you go into the details, then the idea that it was a simple battle between good people and evil people um, breaks up. As has become clear by now, this is obviously a historical book, it, it, it's history, but it is also a, a very personal book. And, and my second question relates to the combination of, of these two aspects. Um, history, 
as we all know, needs to be as objective as possible. But oftentimes, objective history is also countered by personal histories. And as, as you just mentioned, um, with the French and, and their uh, attitude towards the, the resistance, on many an occasion, your father wrote that he was disappointed after the war about all those people who were hailed as members of the resistance, but who actually hadn't taken part in it. So again, here we have these uh, two different histories. And, and I was wondering, how did you go about this in, in your work, in, in writing the book? Because on one hand, you had the official histories, but then you had this material that your father wrote, and that oftentimes contradicts what one can read in the official books. So how did you manage to, to keep these, uh, these two different tales uh, uh, separated, but also try to unite them in a certain way? Yes, I think it's not only that he, that uh, many people claimed to be in the resistance who hadn't been, but actually some people were obliged to cover up their involvement in, in the resistance in order to advance in their careers, because there were so many people who um, who wished that they had been in the resistance or wanted to give the impression that they had been. And so they actually discriminated against those who knew better than them. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, and I think the other thing that I, that was very important to him and which, and he says this is why he, he, after a while, he refused to talk about it, was that people wanted to tell the story in terms of great heroes. I mean, particularly, you know, young men with armed with... Um, pistols and things. But as far as he was concerned, in his experience, the real heroes were much more quiet than that. And he himself, he said he never he never went around with a pistol. It was far too uh, far too dangerous. He had to, he had to, he had to, he had to yes, he had to he had to be careful. He didn't he, you know he and and the real heroes, well one for example was this retired school teacher called Madame Barbier, who um who he, he was she was just about the only person he met who I mean, he was an educated man whom, and he liked talking about books. He was about the only person he met in the resistance who wanted to talk about books. He made great friends with her and she said he could come and stay with her any time. And he often did spend the night at the house. And, um, and eventually, uh, after he'd given up, he'd, he'd escaped into Switzerland and he wasn't any longer active in France, um, she was arrested and uh, and was uh, taken to a concentration camp and died there. Apparently, died. Uh, she lost her mind. She went. This is the story. And I think he thought, well, those are the real heroes of the resistance. This old lady uh, who was who was generous and hospitable and highly intelligent and bookish. And who lost her mind and lost her life, and those aren't the sorts of, you know, it wasn't someone with a gun at all. It was someone who gave him nice meals and gave him a comfortable bed to sleep in, mm -mm. but was risking just as much as the yeah. people who were in frontline, uh, glamorous, glamorous jobs. Yeah, I think it was the. I think what he hated was the idea that there had ever been anything like glamour about um, being active in the resistance. Now, one aspect that that particularly struck me uh, was your father's desire to not die because of the mistakes made by other people. And I, he obviously meant here generals or, or colonels or, or other people in charge. He, in, in that way, he did not really want to be an ordinary soldier, as he obviously never, never, never was in the war. Mm. He was in a certain sense what, would, what one could call an individualist. But that individualism obviously came with great danger and responsibility a lot more than would be the case for an ordinary soldier, if one can imagine. And uh, as your father himself commented after the war, as, as he quoted, as you write in the book, if the other side had won, he, would ha he wouldn't have been remembered as the hero you just mentioned, but simply as a terrorist. Yes, he, li he liked saying that he, he was a terrorist. In fact, I, um, I mean, one of the few times he did mention it was, uh, was it in the, in the 19... 80s when um, Margaret Thatcher um, condemned Nelson Mandela as a terrorist um, and I remember my father saying to me but I was a terrorist too and I got a medal from George the sixth for it. Um, and I think uh, yes I mean obviously the, the I mean in 
the, the Vichy regime and the and the German occupying forces uh, always put it about that the resistance, um, well, I mean, their word for the resistance was the terrorists, and um, and clearly it's a word that is um, you know deployed for propagandistic purposes. It's not really a word with any objective um, historical or political meaning. We have been circling around this world already, word a little bit, the word hero, and and. I think we both agree that it's a very troublesome word. Uh, and it seems that, as you already mentioned also, your father had some serious issues with the word as well. There is this whole section dedicated in the book um, to his these thoughts of his on, on heroism. And although, like you mentioned, that he got celebrated after the war, he seemed to be very uncomfortable with this. And, and he insisted on those who were not celebrated, as you already mentioned, the ordinary people, the ordinary heroes, as he quotes. And that obviously brought to my mind the ordinary villain of Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, Eichmann mm. trial. So how, how did, did this thought, uh, what, what made you think about this, this, this insistence on the ordinariness, either side on, on the ordinariness of the villain, but also on the ordinariness of, of, of the heroes, if one would say that. How, how did you deal with that when reading your father's texts? I think that as far as heroism was concerned, he was worried about, well, a certain style of telling the story of the war, which, um, and he said, you know, he, he was quite well known. He made a film about it, a feature film in which he starred uh, representing his own exploits and people wanted him to come and give talks about it. And he said he couldn't stand it because they all wanted to, they, they had an idea of what, um, what a hero ought to be and they wanted it to be exciting and they um and he and he found it i think he found it sort of morally disgusting and i think that then he and that's why he did eventually i mean like millions of other people involved in the war he he then decided to be more or less silent about it and a lot of people have said to me oh well of course he was silent about it, it he was traumatized and i think uh, I don't like that way of putting it, partly because I think people help themselves too readily to the language of psychopathology. I mean, there is such a thing as trauma and traumatic mutism. Um, but my father wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a psychopathology of trauma that made him not want to, I mean, so he could talk about it if he wanted to, but he preferred not to. And I think he preferred not to out of respect for all the people who had made sacrifices and who if he allowed his story to be caught up in traditional narrative frameworks of heroism uh, would become ignored yeah okay thank you jonathan this was a uh very enlightening and I really enjoyed reading your book and for all the people who are currently in lockdown uh, this is a lovely book to read in these in this period and it's a uh, book of 200 pages so again like the one I mentioned in precedence of, of Agamben you can actually read the whole book and it takes you away you can read it in one single day and you will feel really good afterwards so thanks again Jonathan thanks everybody for listening to this first session of Bookaholics of whom I hope many other can come thank you